caution is advised. Hey everyone, this video is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering you a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial membership. All you need to do is go to audibletrial.com forward slash bgunlocked. The link is in the description below, and now enjoy the video. Hey everyone, welcome back to Board Games Unlocked, and Brian and I are finishing the top 100 games of all time. We are doing segments our 10 through number one. So these are the, the cream of the crop, the, 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 man, I don't know any other sayings. It's the only one. The, the best games ever. Um, so, yeah, yeah, what? Awesome. I know, right? That was a pretty good one. <laughs> <laughs> pretty good analogy. Uh, I have two new games in my top 100. I have one. You have one? I bet I know what that one is. Um, oh, yeah? Probably. Maybe <clears throat> not. Well, I should. I, but then again, I don't remember all the other 90 games that, that we talked about. Um, anyway, so let's get started with my number 10, which was number 13 last year, so it rose three spots and was number 12 the year before, so it's just kind of increased, and the increase is because I finally played the solo variant for it, and that is Anachrony. Anachrony is uh, my favorite Mind Clash game. Uh, the theme is that the, a meteor is about to hit Earth, and uh, you are a civilization that is prepping for that Armageddon. Not try, You're not trying to prevent it. Um, but you are trying to basically be the best faction after the world has ended to, you know, take, kind of take over and be the ones in charge. What makes this game super, super unique is that it revolves around time travel. So there's a, uh, phase in the game where you can actually borrow workers or borrow resources from yourself in the past, but at some point you have to fix that, otherwise you create paradoxes, which right. can actually start you know, really hurting you by giving you negative points and things like that and destroying um, your buildings. Uh, it's your kind of a worker placement game um, as a kind of an engine builder is where you are, you have certain types of workers that can do certain things out in the field, but to go out in the world, you have to have mechs. And I have the, the exosuit pack where it's miniature mechs and kind of what you were talking about with outer, outer rim is you s slot your worker in. Right, right. It's just, it's just more aesthetically pleasing. Right. But you have to have these suits prepped to be able to go out and get uh, hire new workers, get minerals, do trading, um, uh, and which then they, uh, allow you to to do other things. Um, but uh, the other actions you can do is you can buy these buildings, which you can then slot into your own player board and create unique uh, in-house kind of actions. Which there's so many variations for that. And the reason why I am just so enamored with this game is just the streamlined nature of the worker placement. Like, it's, I just, I have a thing for these big, grandiose kind of Euro games um, that have an awesome theme. I think it does the time travel aspect really simple, but also thematically well done. Um, like, I love the, the, the difference between being able to go out and do your resource stuff and then your own building stuff inside. Right. Um, it kind of has that same mechanic where it's like your workers can get tired, so you have to wake them up so you have a morale track. Lots of ways to get victory points um, through end game objectives or also where your morale's track, who, who, if you travel the most. There's also super projects that you can build. And your super projects kind of remind me of like the factory cards in Scythe where it's like if you build these, then... Like, it's, it's a really good ability by sending certain workers there. So, it just it just fires on all cylinders for me. The solo variant is the best that I've played. Um, does a fantastic job of having an AI that, one, doesn't feel broken, but also is unique in the fact that it has certain numbers, uh, six tokens on certain areas of the board, and you roll a die, and whatever the die is, that's the action it's doing, but it has... The, the numbers stay on a particular track. So like number one can only do one of two actions and it'll cycle back and forth and uh, and it'll do, it'll like collect water and then uh, water is used too for a variety of things, but it'll use that to gain points. And it's just, it's so good and it's not like overly complicated. Um, so Anachrony was one of those games that was probably the heaviest I had played at the time that has since changed. So it's, it seems a little bit more simple now, but it's still, like, Mind Clash, just, they do things right. 
I always toggle once again between this and Tricarion, but Anachrony always ed edges it out. So that's my number 10. All right. My number 10 is my new one to this list. Okay. You said you knew it. I said I, I, I think I would know it. What is it? Champions? Nope. Oh, okay. Champions did not hit my list because I hadn't played it before. Gotcha. This, so gotcha. It, it would definitely be in there. Okay. Well, um, then I have no idea what it is. It is Vindication. Oh, damn. Damn, yes. all right. Vindication from Orange Nebula. Mm -hmm. Um this game, I I didn't jump on the Kickstarter when it first came out and everything. I heard people talk about it, so mm -hmm. then that's when I decided to go <clears throat> get my own Kickstarter copy to play it. And I love it's it's a unique enough game. Um, it's a Euro mm -hmm. style. Um, the theme I think is there enough. What the theme of this game is is you're like a you're a kind of a just a real shitty person <laughs> and you get booted off of your spaceship and you're just left behind on a planet and then what this whole game about is about is you redeeming yourself you're vindicating yourself you're making yourself a better a good person. guy a better person now and all that stuff that's the whole question of the game can you stay shitty and do well or just every action. You're pretty much moving okay. in the direction. Okay. I, mean, I wasn't sure if it was kind of like that. Yeah, that you're, you're pretty much moving okay. in that direction. Whether some do it better than others. Because it's purely competitive, obviously. <laughs> some... <laughs> but uh, So what happens is like <clears throat> it, the board will be a bunch of hexes mm -hmm. out there. And it's it'll be you'll, you'll see where everything is yep. at the very beginning of the game. You're going to have your own player board. Now on your player board, your little dashboard, there's going to be like, you're going to see like two hands. And there's going to be these globes. So... What will happen is there's, you'll have cubes all over there of your color. Okay. There's going to be potential energy, and then there's just the middle, and then there is, um, oh my gosh. What's Kinetic the, energy. No, I have it right here, sorry. I, I can't, I never remember the name of it. Uh, conviction. Okay. So, potential, regular conviction. Um, and that's the... You can use it once it's in the conviction gotcha. to, to to do stuff, okay. right? Um, because there's currencies and there odds and ends. So what you do on your turn is um, you get three actions. You can activate a companion that you'll gain throughout the get deal. You can use it to move. You can use it to interact with a tile. Every tile has its own little ability. Gotcha. Um, sometimes okay. there's two of the same kind. Sometimes there's just a it's a independent solo tile. Um, so there's places where you can increase your mount. So if when you have paid it, increase your mount, you, you can maybe move only two hexes to start with, but then you can move three, then you oh, can move okay. four, you know, and then, so you're flying all over this board yeah. by the end of the game if you do that. Um, but what you're doing is you do actions and you, you pick up, there's these different, uh, piles of colors of cubes okay. around the, around the board. Um, it's easy to get, I want to say... There's three of them that are just kind of generally easy to get. And then to get the harder ones, you have to combine the like two. Like certain colors? The, like you may have to combine the strength and this to be able to pull I from see. Okay. this. And then that may be something you need to buy this. So there's where your Euro stuff comes in because you're, okay. you're re, it's kind of an advanced resource management in a way. Um, <laughs> so all the while, there's other people on the board. There's not like fighting yeah, but you're just hosing people, and okay. how you can you can fight monsters to gain strength, yeah. or whatever. Any action you take, though, following that theme, everything you do is creating a better you. Okay, right um, until the end game. Mm -hmm. Now, end game is unique, and I don't know if this has been done in the other games. So I can't think of any of that that I know of. There's one in-game trigger at the beginning of the game. All right. Um, and that is getting rid of all of your... I, think, I believe it's getting rid of all of your cubes and have them all out on the board. Okay. <clears throat> um, I believe that's the one that's constant. But then what happens is once... Because uh, the board itself is a huge hex. Mm -hmm. So there's a scoring track that goes around. Once somebody hits <clears throat> a, p a point on that hex, then a new in-game... Uh, a random in-game trigger pops out. Okay. And then, so every time 
the, f- f- the it gets hit first. Mm-hmm. So not every time, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. So the uh, first place hits here, and that, so it'll be two in-game triggers. So uh, the next one will be a third, which I know is random. Well, no, I no, it, I'm it, I'm I feel like I played a game that did that, but I can't think of one. Yeah, and I that's why I I, I can't think nothing's, of it either. Nothing's like jumping out to me, but I um, feel like that has been done somewhere. One of the one of the things I was worried about when I heard that was like, well, that's gonna suck because if you're building for one thing and then all of a sudden an end game comes out for somebody else, mm-hmm. then you're done. They've gotten really clever with those with those end game things yeah. though, because they're not like. You know, they're pretty much things everybody's going for anyway. I see. You know, so it's saying? not like so, the one's going to come out. It's like, oh, okay, lucky me. You're right. I okay. mean, it could, could yeah. but it's not like you win if that happens. The scoring happens. After oh, okay. That. So like, if something does pop out and it ends, because mm-hmm. obviously, it's to keep yes, the game. That's true. Because it it says on the box. 15 to 30 minutes per player. Oh yeah. Okay. So I mean, it's not like it's meant to be a super long, yeah. drawn out thing anyway. Um. So then when it ends, then you tally up your scores, you'll have things you've defeated, and you'll mm-hmm. have victory points. The Kickstarter version has a lot of metal and minis mm-hmm. and all kinds of cool stuff. You know, That's it's, right over there. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely one that, it's, it's unique, and it has, it, yeah. it's got kind of... Have they Got done me any... enamored? Yeah, exactly. I was good. Sorry, I was gonna say, have they done anything Orange Nebula before? No, this was their first one. That's what um, I thought. I listened to their podcast. Oh, I have not lately, but I they have a podcast that they okay. talk about their business stuff. And That's pretty cool. the reason that they don't pump out a lot of games is because they live mm-hmm. like this game. There was some companies, smaller companies. We'll maybe be working on this game, and this will be the one they're getting quite close to. And then we'll go ahead and start working on this one. Mm-hmm. You know, that they live, breathe everything. This game, gotcha. It's, it's just, that's why it's the the. I mean, that's the art's awesome. Yeah, and, you know, and I, and I yeah. different companies do it different ways. You know, there's companies that pump out tons of games, right? And then there's these guys that have one game under their belt. Yeah, but it's quality. But that's yes, the thing is like you know, people who pump out is like you become desensitized to right. all the games. You're like, I don't fucking know. But whenever it's a game like Vindication, where it's like, well, that one was a banger, so now it's like, whenever Orange Nebula releases another game, it's like, oh, like it, right. it draws attention. They, like their new one, they're working on Kickstarter, unsettled. Like people flock to it immediately because they knew, oh, well, they've only done this one game, but it was so good. Awakened Realms was the same way. Right now, they've grown bigger, so they can do a lot more. But yeah, I mean, that's how you start. I think that's the way to do it. You, too many people who are smaller try to do too much at once and end up. Like half-assing all their Is games. Settled, still going. I think so. I yeah. I didn't even know they had a new Kickstarter. I, I mentioned it last time. For fuck's sake! <laughs> I gotta yeah, go look we're talking about vindication. We're not. I gonna... know. I know. But, I, uh, <laughs> but yes, it's it, it is on Kickstarter right now. I have a feeling that you'll like it. I, I mean. I mean, I, I, it's hard to say. Yeah, I, it, I mean, it, it, it really is. There could always just be that one thing that could be like, well, that sucked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it's. I'm it's, very, I'm very intrigued by the theme, so it is a game yeah. that I am gonna have to try. I, clearly, I have it all over there. So yeah. with it, with its newest expansion, which was on your top ten of the year, right? Yeah, and it adds solo and adds okay. like factions and different stuff. Yeah, it's, it adds. So you said more. you said it's so you don't attack each other. Is it more like kind of like the the passive aggressive nature? Of yes, what, okay. like like you can't you can block their mo- their okay. movement to make them have to go further out. Okay. It's, it hasn't gotten to that point really yet, just yeah. because you're trying to be a better person. You're so you, if you go and battle somebody else, that's not. That's true. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like so, you're you can kind of pass it. Yeah, like you said, pass aggressively. <laughs> like I'm being a good person as I stick my oh, foot out, trip you. Right, you right. Oh no, I didn't know. Oh, you were going this way. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Right. Yo, well, I can't move. You have to go around. <clears throat> yeah. So All right. no, it's it's a really 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 good game though. It kind of went under the radar, I think. I know, you know Tom Vassell talk, talked about it. Yeah, and he I, talked about it, and then there's some of the podcasts I listen to talk but about. But you also, them being see. a smaller company, you can't really find it. Yeah, it's, so, it's not like out a ton of places. I don't think it's on retail. Yeah, I mean, it was. Was it? It, it, went, it went to Miniature Market and stuff. Okay. I, know, but I don't know if it's still there or not. Yeah. But, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. My number nine was number five last year, uh, so it only fell four spots and it didn't exist in 2017. And it is not my highest cooperative, but it's my favorite cooperative game, and that is Spirit Island. Uh, This was earlier on your list, I believe. Um, So Spirit Island is a 
a completely unique cooperative game. Uh, one in theme and in gameplay. So the theme is that you have uh, you know colonizers going onto your island, and you play the spirits that are that are trying to fight them off. Um, so you're usually it's the other way around. You have to fight the spirits, but. The thing about this game is that the reason why it's my favorite cooperative is because I believe it makes the cooperative nature feel... It, it, it does that that the best. And what I mean by that is, like, everyone has unique powers and unique abilities uh, that they can do, and their powers are integrated in kind of a, a slow-fast mechanic, where it's like, well, I can play a fast one that'll go before the invaders do something, but then the slow one is after the invaders do something. So you really have to work together because everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses. It's a very difficult puzzle. It, it, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, in, in that you have to sit there and you have to know, okay, so if I do this, if I play this fast ability, it's going to do this. Now, how is that going to affect what they are, the invaders are going to do because everyone else only has really good slow powers? Um different ways to actually handle like the the puzzle like you can go a fear route which fear gives you abilities uh and you want to make them afraid because uh that makes it easier to because you have to wipe the wipe the board clean of them that's how you win and in uh at the very beginning of the game you have to get rid of invaders their cities and their towns you have to completely annihilate all of them that is very very difficult to do i have never done it <laughs> it's so hard um, and, uh, as you accumulate more fear, then you get, you know, abilities, uh, or not abilities, but you get, like, events that help you. Um, and then now, once you get to, like, level two, well, you only have to get rid of their cities and towns. Right. Um, and it's like, oh, okay, so that makes sense. And then if you get to level three, you only have to get rid of their cities. So, as a game, but, like, they're gonna start, you know, infecting the land, and they're gonna start, uh, spreading a lot quicker, but it's kind of an area control where you have to have... It, it, the, the component quality for the game is really kind of garbage. But you have these discs that are, uh, represent your presence. And so you're spreading out and you're trying to be like, okay, well now I'm going to be over here. So everyone has to just really work together. Utilize their, their faction's ability as well as their power cards in such a cohesive way. That with the added theme on top of it, the really cool powers just make this game sing and i i love it i mean really it only fell just because it's kind of a complicated game because you kind of have to know your faction really well and at this point there's a bunch of different different factions one of my favorites is actually the basic or uh, kind of the core game or not it's not a core game it's one of the the starter ones which is like the Oh man, the shadow, the shadow that flickers like flame. They all have really unique names, but they're centered around fear. So a lot of their powers do fear-based attacks, um, but that doesn't kill anyone. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, well, yeah, now they're scared, but they're not going away. So you need, okay, well, can you get rid of that? And then there's other factions that heal the land from infections because that kind of has a pandemic vibe where it's like if infection hits, it spreads, and there's only a limited number of resources there. A lot of, well, not a lot of modules. One of the modules actually gives the invaders a, uh, uh, a nationality. So it's like, oh, they're, these are the invaders from Sweden or whatever. And they now they play a little bit different. Because yeah, they have their own abilities. And stuff. Yeah, they have their own abilities and things like that. So <coughs> there's just a lot of ways you can play this game. But it is, it's it's so good. It's, it's like, I love all the, all the factions that I've seen and that I've played as have always been... Super fun. It kind of reminds me of, like, Root. It tells you the difficulty of how to play right, it on right. the back, which is nice. And kind of like, oh, well, this has a high, you know, fear rate, but low mortality, or, or vice versa. Or, uh, and and your your main actions are different on your board, and how you level up is different. But, yeah, just that, that cohesion of, of powers is really what I love about it. Because there is one where it's like, because, like, with the tree... Uh, faction is the, super slow. That's the one I've played the most. Yeah, the and the, they're and the ones that are like kind of like they protect the land, so it's like <clears throat> they don't do a lot of killing, but they protect areas and things like that. But then they're usually slow, so they're going after. But then there's like a faction that has abilities that make other people slow cards fast. So it's like, oh, I can make everyone's and so it's just that's what I look for in a cooperative game. There's really no quarterbacking in this at all because. Mm -hmm. Everyone is in like, like in, uh, integral to survival of the island. Right. So that's why it's my number nine, Spirit Island. What right. number was it for you? I can't remember. 
Um, I think you had mentioned too far off. Yeah, I feel like you mentioned uh, it would go higher the more you played it. Yeah, for sure. Spirit Island is twenty nine. Okay, and it was oh, okay. forty seven the year before that. So I mean, yeah, jumping. Yeah. So twenty spots ahead. <clears throat> I just don't get a chance to play it except. It's a game. I mean, you can essentially you could play it slow, I play it, but that's it's how like... only, that's the only way I play it because I tried teaching it to my wife and it's just like mm-hmm. deer in the headlights yeah. because there's so much, mm-hmm. you know. And that's why I've played the same faction because I've I knew that one, so I'm trying to learn hers and teach her you know, yeah. and stuff. That's, yeah, it's it's yeah. it's a tough the, one. The one thing that <clears throat> if I could is I I wish because they have two types of powers. You have like. You, you have your starting ones, which are kind of unique to you, but then you have a stack of, like, level ones and a stack of level twos, and those are just random. Mm-hmm. I wish that you had your own deck of, of like, level ones at, that pertain to your faction more mm-hmm. so. Because there's, like, if I'm the Shadow that Flickers, like, Flame, and I do a lot of Fear Base, I can get, like, a Lightning power. And I'm like, oh, that doesn't feel that thematic. Right. That's, like, my only gripe with it. Um but I mean, they have the they have one expansion now, Bears and Claws, or I think that's what it was called. I don't remember what it was called. Bear but Claw. Yeah, okay, I was right. Yeah. And it added certain tokens, and it added new factions, and then their latest Kickstarter, Jagged, Jagged Earth, Earth, which adds uh, I feel like scenarios. I feel like it was like a campaign kind of thing, and then, and more factions. So very excited for all of that. Yep, I like it, and it's one that I just I need to find a good way to to teach to it. Teach it. Yeah, that, I can't. That, that's my thing. It's like because you taught it to me, mm-hmm. and it was it was difficult, but yet it wasn't. I mean, once you picked it up, right? Kinda, you know, right. but it's it's just a it's a. I mean, the good thing one. is is that it's cooperative, so it's mm-hmm. like, oh well, let yeah, me see so your. Yeah, we just got started. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, so you don't have to. <clears throat> unfortunately, with a lot of games that are very difficult to teach, it's like, unfortunately, it's co- it's competitive. So mm-hmm. it's like, well, I mean. Like I guess well I guess we'll I'll just work with you but yeah uh, it does have that benefit of being a complicated cooperative game right all right well my number nine has been on my list for the last few years it was number eight two years ago it was number eight last year and it's number nine this year so it's pretty much yep. locked in and that is Fire Team Zero wow uh, from Emergent Games um, that's so I'm crazy. probably one of the high. very few people in this country that have this in my top ten <laughs> games of all time. Um, but uh, I just the more I play, I mean, you know, the more you play it, you've only you've only went through the one the one yeah mission. Well, we the, played it, me and you, and then we lost badly. It was, it was the crappy mission, and then we the played yeah, one. and then we played with Cat that same mission and won, and I haven't played it since. Right, but, I'm, but even then, I was still like I've been looking at like getting my own copy, but now it's yeah. just too expensive. I'm like, yeah, oh. it is. It's such a good game with one little thing that if may or may not be a house rule with mm-hmm. the whole coin thing. Yeah, it just depends on how big of a issue it is but but pretty much <clears throat> um we'll al- alternate reality world war ii setting uh it, it's got like hell is coming up from from the earth mm-hmm. um you're this team and it's based on a set of books called fire it's fire team zero you're it's four uh military soldiers there's uh like the colonel and there's a uh, marksman. There's the whole stealthy, like snake eyes from G.I. Oh. Joe kind of deal. It's hand to hand combat, and yep. and then there's the uh, grenadier. <clears throat> but uh, and you go through these scenarios, and you have you know your terrain issues, you know, and all, just just all this all this stuff's against you because um, rough terrain really limits you Mm -hmm. in your movement but the monsters can just move through freely um so how a normal turn would go is you do all your stuff attack do whatever and then the monsters would get their movement and spawning and all that stuff because there's 12 spawn points all over the board any board has 12 spawn points Mm -hmm. and you're gonna roll a d12 and that's where monsters are gonna start spawning from and it just gets ridiculous you know um all the while you're trying to complete this objective, which is either like the first one, you're trying to find the parts to a boat so you can get, use the boat to get across the river. Yep. Um, and, uh, your cards, it's, it's hand management, uh, as well, because your cards are split in half. The top half of your card is used on your turn for offensive purposes. 
um, to help attack and stuff that'll have symbols on it, uh, which will be when you roll the dice for the attack. Um, if it has bullets, bullets are what count as hits. If it has fists, fists are what count as hits, and vice versa. Yep. Um, the bottom half of the card is the reaction card. So if it's my turn, Seth can play a reaction card to help bolster me or help me in some way or protect me mm -hmm. from an attack, whatever. But the cards are also cards in your hand at that point are also your life. So you have to watch out for that as well. So you don't want to spend too much to help out another person if you know you're going to get the shit kicked out of you in the next mm -hmm. turn <laughs> because you can only draw up at the very beginning of each round. Yeah. Um, so it's just a, it's a really good uh, strategic game. Yep. Um, and see, and here's the thing: it's it's <clears throat> difficult. It's very difficult. Um, I think the one that the only one that, scenario that I've played is kind of the most difficult. Yeah. So I far, feel like yeah. Um, but even then, it's 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 a cooperative game that's difficult without being random. Like everyone says, Ghost Stories is super hard. Yeah, it is because the whole fucking game is random. Right. Like there's, I mean, right. the only randomness is where they spawn. Right. But but, you, but they get to you in one turn. Yeah. So it doesn't really, really, really matter where they spawn. <laughs> it's like, hey, I might have <laughs> might have one time where they won't get to me in this one move. But yeah. Yeah. That's uh, the one thing about that game that I, like, if I could do anything, and it's, I don't even know if the company is a thing anymore because their website yeah, is down. What's the company? Emergent Games. Okay. It's the only game they've ever made. Um, you go to their website, their website's not up kept. They still have files on their webpage, which I will highly suggest if you ever track down a version of this, it comes with a CD in the box. Don't use the CD, obviously, because who has a CD player anymore? <laughs> right. But, but um, they have their MP3 files on a page so I've downloaded all the mp3 pile files to my phone and it's like radio tracks and so it reads all the scenarios set up that's really and cool the aftermath because every time you finish a deal you you depending on how the you finish it there'll be a different track what happens with this game is you there's a there is a family a, a monster family that you will deal with for the first I think three or four missions, and that's those are all kind of clumped into one story, those three or four missions. So you'll deal with the children of the whatever. I can't remember. Children of the Bald. Of the whatever. corn. No. <clears throat> but then, I'm pretty um, sure it's children of the corn. There's all these different monster families, so then you play the second set as you move throughout the story, and it's a different monster family with vile creatures and mm -hmm. all kinds of crazy stuff. It's, I mean, it's Excuse a me. really cool game. Here's the thing. It's like, it was one of those games that made me want to check out the book series. Similar to how Battlestar Galactica made me want the series. Like this one, it's like, oh, this is a really interesting theme. It's not a whole lot of World War, alternate history of World War II. Right. So. Um, and the thing with it as well is like, they've had these two big expansion boxes. They have the Africa cycle and the mm -hmm. Europe cycle, which brings you those parts of the World War II. But then it's different monster families, right. different scenarios. So, I mean, this is not, this is in my top ten, and I haven't even gotten into the Africa and Europe cycle. Yeah, yet. yeah. I'm not finding anything on this company. Like, I went to their website, and you like go went to, to shop, click, and there's nothing. You can't buy anything. There's not even website. a shop option. Like it's catalog. Yeah. So, and then like if I click on their featured product, like their featured products, it says page not found. Right. So, but the, if you go, you can still see their. Um, their files are still live on the page, like for the audio files and yeah. stuff. If you go searching, digging in, yeah. So, so that's where I got I those know. files from. But, but anyway, like um, and I got this game on a steal from a guy. A guy sold this entire box for me to me, shipped for thirty bucks. Damn, <laughs> because he was clearing out his closet and stuff. And Man, just, and I was like, hell yes, right? Well, and that was before I knew anything about the game. Yeah. Damn. And lucky you. Yeah. So, uh, yes, Fire Team Zero. If you can find it, give it a shot, because it's an awesome one. For a reasonable price. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. My number eight was number nine last year, so it rose one spot uh, and didn't exist in 2017. And this is... Man, I just realized... Okay, Anachron is competitive. So it's another uh, cooperative game with a Cthulhu kind of feel, uh, and that is Deep Madness. So Deep Madness is uh, kind of like your Dead Space Cthulhu uh, Cthulhu mix kind of game. Um, you play as a 
I guess a hero or as as a person that's uh, going to an under underwater uh, facility, and it's kind of like if you know anything about Dead Space, where it's like the some some experiment gone wrong that essentially killed everyone in in the the space station. Here it's a similar situation underwater, and what that does is it it in, it adds a like a water flood mechanic. So you have a bunch of creatures. And a whole, you know, you know, variety of different types of monsters. And I have the full Kickstarter thing, so I have everything that uh, it comes with. But there's so many different types of monsters, and they all do different things and have different ways to try and kill you. Uh, but you, um, there are certain areas that the, the, the tiles will be flooded, which now you have an oxygen meter if you're doing actions right. in water. Uh, it costs oxygen, which then can eventually start hurting you. Um... The tiles can also flip to their uh, demented side, which when that happens, then tokens get placed, which now cause an effect to happen. Like, oh, in this, in if you're in this tile, you roll one less die, or if you end your turn in this tile, you take a horror, and things like that. But we'll make this game one. They're scenario based, and the scenarios do tie into one another. But there's a couple things that make this game awesome. One is the turn order. So the heroes that you play. And there's always going to be six, like regardless of how many people are actually playing, so some people will end up controlling two, right. is you have a card that goes in a row, and then you'll have an equal number of monsters, so you're linked kind of to them. And how that works is like, if I'm going first, then I will go, then that particular monster will go, then you, then a, and it goes back, it alternates like that, which is really fantastic, because that's one of the things that made... Uh, Star Wars Imperial Assault better than Descent is because it's not all of us go, then all of them go, because right. when that happens, usually the enemies are always better off. But you can plan for that. You can look and be like, okay, if we kill, there's a monster called Blind, which makes you stunned. But it's like, if we there's one left, so if we kill, if I can kill this one, then that means that all get to do something, then they won't go, then it'll just go straight to another player. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can strategically plan for turn turn order like that, which is fantastic. The other thing that I really like about this is unlike Arkham Horror, where sanity was another basically trait that you had to worry about, right. uh, as well as your health. So in this game, your health is still your health. If you take damage, you take damage. But in this, you can utilize sanity to give you, hey, I'll take a sanity to re-roll, or, or I'll do this to get, get an ability. But what happens, and that's, you just basically have a max of sanity. But when you kill monsters or do anything else, your sanity flips over to madness. And so you, you can use sanity as a benefit, but you don't want to hold on too much because that turns to madness and you can't easily get rid of madness. When you get three madness tokens, you take a madness card. And there's so, there's a stack of madness. And it's, it's mm. just... it's They're all awful. They're all th it, it, This game is 100% thematic. I, I love this theme. It's just, once again, just it does everything for me. But the madness cards are usually like buffs or things like that, where it's like, oh, you don't want these. But what's also cool is if you kill monsters and you don't have sanity equal to you know their threat, you get consciousness cards, which are good things. Right. So you have a lot of ways to kind of balance out. Oh, if we kill a bunch, but I'm not, I don't have any sanity. Then let's say like I kill one that has a horror value of two. I don't have any sanity. I would draw two consciousness cards. If I had one sanity, that would flip to horror. I would draw one. And all the scenarios so far are radically different, uh, thematically grounded. It, it's very, very difficult, very intense. All the heroes have their own long backstory and just also have unique abilities. It's just, it's fantastic. Like, uh, they actually, their latest Kickstarter came out with, like, an organizer for, like, all the stuff. So now it's in two boxes. One is the, all the miniatures and then the other one is for everything else, and they did a really good job with that. So, lots of... It, it does something else that's really neat, is that the cards that you find are like snippets that you find in a video game, where it's like, oh, I find like an excerpt or a book or a page that doesn't pertain to the scenario right now, but it pertains to the overall world. So I always... I thought that was kind of more video gamey that I, that I very much enjoyed. Um, yeah, it's it's a fantastic cooperative game, and it went up one because I was playing it more at the time, and yeah, it's it's so good. Very, very difficult, but not impossible. So, that's my yeah. number eight. Yeah, that one's another one that looks good. I always get that, like you said, I always get the, the deep space 
Dead Space. Or Dead Space, I'm yeah. say. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's right there. And in fact, one of the characters you can play is, it's basically Isaac Clarke. It yeah. looks just like him, but his name's not. I, they also have, I think in the game, her name's like Amanda Weaver, and she looks like Sigourney Weaver. Oh, yeah. And she actually comes with a, with a cat. Uh, a cat and the cat. I can't remember what the cat's name, but it, it's a token that it causes mon. No, it's Jonesy in the. Oh, oh in the, okay. But in I the game, in, in the game, I don't remember what it's called. But in the game, the the cat actually draws the monsters towards it, but which is good. But also, the more monsters that are in its spot, she takes like madness tokens for it. So it's like there's a give and take. Um, and there's like one that looks like H.P. Lovecraft and all that, mm. so there's a lot of nods to certain characters, and that just adds more to the for me love in this game. All right, so my number eight <clears throat> was number nine last year. Oh, okay, so like mine. And then Funny. it was twenty four the year before that. Wow. Okay. Dang. And it was Mansions of Madness Second Edition. Wow. Um. Again. You know, this one is just, they keep pumping it, doing it the right way on this one, you know, like, like they don't have to release any more physical product mm -hmm. now. Yeah. I mean, I, I still have to buy the Horrific Journeys. I just, oh, yeah, I think I just bought their latest one. Wait, yeah, Path to the Serpent is yeah, their so latest one. I don't have that one, one either. Yeah, I just so bought There's that. two of them I don't have. But, um, but anyway, uh, so, Mansions of Madness this is the second edition, obviously. The first edition was an all versus one mm -hmm. mess in a box. Um, this it was one, cool at the time. <laughs> yeah, this one turns over um, to the app for uh, ease of game management, um, especially if you have the organizer that you just I just put, put together. together. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> I don't have that yet, but <laughs> but um, surprisingly easy to put together. Yeah, yeah, I was very surprised. So. Anyway, this is that pure co-op, um, and unless you go insane, uh, <laughs> but but um, I play it solo. Still it doesn't matter still like that, yeah. Um, but uh, you're just going through, and there's different scenarios, you know, and, and you can, and I don't know how many they put out DLC wise. I, I, I will take a them. good old gander. But at this point, there's tons of missions out there and what I like about it is they put their difficulty on there they kind of put the time span like there's that one that takes three to six hours or six something. hours I think and you I know, have done that where one. you're all over town and mm -hmm. doing stuff so it's that one is it's really cool because that one is like detected like mm -hmm. like your deduction but uh, at the like I said at this point they could just stop with the physical product though mm -hmm. I mean there's so many tiles and so many monsters and so many different odds and ends that they could just get creative with what's out there and just make scenarios now and they, they could just do it that way yeah I really you hope know? they actually start doing that because I'm gonna be pissed if I spent that much money on a on that wooden crate I can't see them putting too much but especially since they've been talking about how they're wanting to go more into like pumping out yeah stuff yeah Although I'm hoping that they kind of slow down a little bit um, the I don't know if you've ever done this. Have you ever ran your the app through your big screen? No, I have not. It's always off my phone. We we did that at a friend's house where we ran it through a TV and kind of he had surround sounds and everything's in in there. So it was just like playing the whole app, the the music, the the uh, sound effects and all that stuff was happening all around us, you know, and they had the big screen TV showing us the yeah, board and everything. That'd be really, really cool. cool. Um, uh, there are three DLCs. Okay. Real okay. quick. For, 22 total scenarios. Okay. Gotcha. So, um, you know, this, this is one of my... Let me see. I better look before I say that. I think this is my highest... Yeah. This would be my highest ranked Cthulhu. Okay. Uh, or Tolkien, not Tolkien. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, love uh, Lovecraft uh, style game. Mm. Um, just because of the story and, mm -hmm. and the ease of it, you know the the other version you had to have everything preset up, all the car, you know all that crap. It just took yeah. forever. This one it just tells you, okay, let's start with this. You you pick your scenario, throw this tile out, put yeah. this stuff here, 
go. Yeah. You know, and, and it just kind of, it just is awesome. And it's really cool because the you mentioned the difficulty and the app shows you the difficulty, but it's like, that could mean a variety of things. Like the one of the ones in the newest expansion that I just happened to glance at was a five star difficulty. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, is that, does that mean it's going to be difficult combat wise, deduction, mm -hmm. like uh, just any, any way that they want to tell the story. Um, and I mean, you're right. They, they could just start making DLC for it. Like, um, cause I'll be pissed. I'll be so mad if, cause I just bought the latest one. It's like, if this doesn't fit, then I'm going to sue. You have the recurring nightmares on stuff. The the one where the it transferred stuff the first, stuff from first. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. Because I had everything for first edition yeah. when second edition so came I didn't out. Have any of the first. And that was editions, nice so that just, they added that. Was yeah. like, hey, okay, well, not all of this is gone. You can throw throw it right. in here. So that that does make it a little bit better. So, but anyway, um, what I like too is as you add sets mm -hmm. to this, and which adds monsters and stuff like that then you could go back and play any scenario and those things could pop in there, mm -hmm. you know? So it, it makes, I've played some of those, those scenarios multiple times mm -hmm. and it's different every single time because yep. there's different monsters. There may be a monster from the new set you bought yep. show up, you know, yeah. and stuff. And like, so. it's not just unlike a lot of games where it's just, oh, I did this one and that's it. Like the, the scenarios, not all of them, I think the first one doesn't, but I'll, I think the rest of them might have multiple endings depending mm -hmm. on just how... Like, depending on what you do. And one of the ones, the Escape from Innsmouth, is Kat and I were playing and we did... We were trying to do a certain thing. I'm not going to spoil it, but we got an ending that we were like, oh, like, what the fuck? We didn't know that was a thing. And so that, that that's just always a nice replayability um, thing that comes with the second edition. Mm -hmm. It was uh, 24. See, that's what it was for me two years ago. That's it funny. 24 to 9 to 8. To 8, yep. Awesome. My number seven is new to the list, and this actually came out this past year, uh, at least in 2019. And it is the best wizard game that, yep, yep, the best wizard game that I can think of, and that is Black Rose Wars. So this is uh, by a company called Ludus Magnus Studios, and they're kind of starting to make a name for themselves with big, grandiose kinds of ga kind of games. Their latest one is Cine Tempore, or Sign Tempore. I don't know how it's pronounced. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm pronouncing it like an elitist. So this one is kind of like a, a serious whiz war. And you're, you're playing a mage where you are trying to become the Archmage of the Black Rose Guild. And unlike where it's like, oh, we just need to kill each other. Uh, your goal is to actually try and complete objectives and, and you do get points at the end of the game for destruction of tiles and things like that. Um, but you're trying to have the most victory points at the end of the game. Um, what makes this game so fucking cool is that there are multiple different schools of, of magic. And in the game, uh, you, you can draw from any of them, so you don't, you're not tied to a specific thing. Uh, and they have multiple abilities, like two two sides to it, unless they're traps. And it's kind of uh, programming, where you have your hand of spell cards, and you have a quick sl a quick spell slot, and then three standard spell slots. And on your turn, you can do a variety of actions. You have ones that let you move and just regular attack, or you, you have to at least play your quick spell. Uh, and so you can do a combination of a quick spell and a standard, or one standard and one move, but you can never do two standards. And what's really, really neat is that dual ability. Um, just so many variations and varieties, and, and the schools feel absolutely just different from one another. Um, like, the, the divinity basically gives you a lot of, like, foresight into what people are going to be doing, or the, what the objective cards are going to be that you can try and get. Uh, the illusion school has a lot of traps and things where it's like, Oh, they tried to attack you, but you actually weren't there, and it lets you move somewhere else. Right. A destruction is destruction, like lots of lots of damage, uh, dealing damage. And the other thing about this is it's not like, oh, I happen to kill you, you're gone, is I dealt five points of damage. You have cubes similar to adrenaline where I put them on your track, and then when you do die, whoever has the most damage gets the most points. Um, and now, unfortunately, you don't become less like weaker so you're still a viable option right. 
But the tiles, it's, it's, it's hexagon tiles, so they all do something different, all have a different action. Um, you can damage the room, so you place your own markers, you get points if the room fills up with destruction, if you have the most that dealt it. Um, there's a school called Transmutation, which heals rooms and things like that, or lets you... There was one, because I was like, no one was ever touching it, because that sounds like a lame school. You were like... I was like, you know what, why not? So I took one and allowed me to transfer someone else's damage markers into my own. Uh, so then I had majority. Um, so what's also really cool is the way these uh, event cards come out is they get placed in a certain area and these event cards will move the black rose marker on the victory point track. And what I initially thought was we had to do better than that, but it's actually a timer because once a certain victory point hits like the first moon phase, then all the level ones come out, then level twos come in. And then, so it's basically a timer. So in right. case people aren't doing that hot, the event the event deck will keep the game moving along. Um, and those can be good or bad, uh, depending on when they pop off and how they pop off. Um, the only negative I really have for this game is I just wish that the, the, the mages kind of got maybe a special ability or special thing for doing a particular school of magic right. um the only thing they have is they have their own unique card that goes in a, a deck so if you're playing i think his name's nero if you play him his cards go into the destruction deck but that's it and he's the only one that can cast them but it's like eh, like maybe like oh if he's destruction maybe he does one more damage like nothing too broken but something that like would at least make you feel more unique than just right. having the the one card but yeah, like we were just, it has so many ties to magic, like Magic the Gathering, that uh, my friend Josh was just, we were so into it, and whenever we were playing, I like destroyed them in points, but they were like, I, the, they, they were just having so much fun playing the game, I was playing for Endgame, because I'm just like, fuck you guys, like I'm gonna win, um, but they were just like having fun running around, and there's just so many different ways, whimsical ways, but more serious at the same right. time ways to, to play your cards. I was surprised that this didn't hit any of the um, Dice Hours top 10, because I remember they played it. So, I don't know, maybe not their cup of tea, but I, I love it. And that's my number seven. All right, my number seven was number five last year and wasn't on the list the year before that. Okay. And it was Role Player. Gotcha, nice. Um, role Player is my favorite of the dice allocation mm -hmm. games that you know because like sagrada and it came out around close to the same time um <clears throat> but uh in role player it's it's you're just creating your your D, &D character D &D more or less character. you know it's uh the base box version um that's all you did is you just created your character and then and then buying st uh traits and how you mess with the alignment and stuff like that would depend on kind of your, that was the theme, loose theme on the, mm -hmm. on it's about what type of, of human you were or character you were or whatever. Yep. Um, and then they brought in the monsters and minions expansion, which was the best thing they could have done for the game because that threw in, um, something, some more actions you could do other than just buying mm -hmm. fight minions. You, are preparing to use your character that you created to battle some big uh, evil creature at mm -hmm. the end. Um, they have the the uh, fiends and familiars that should be coming out here fairly soon. I mean, I mean not maybe maybe in the next few months. Yeah, um, which is going to bring another couple extra little steps into it as well. Um, so it's just they they're adding the right stuff you know eventually the adventures will come out mm -hmm. which is going to be able to let your characters created actually be able to use be able to use them on a storied a storytelling adventure mm -hmm. um the mechanics of the game is pretty simple where you're just at the beginning of the game you just get a certain number of dice and you roll them and then allocate them into the places because every race has a they, they kind of are stronger or weaker in certain spots, but once you get your, what is that card called? Alignment or it's your... It's the one that lets you know what you need to score on your... Oh, your attribute. Attributes, yes. Your attribute card will let you kind of know what you're looking to get in the uh, 
the strength row and mm. the intelligence and so on. Um, so then you're placing dice to try to match those up, and you also have colors that you're looking for. This give you points. At the end of the game, you're scoring victory points. Mm -hmm. Whoever has the most victory points wins. Yeah. That's the that's the end game. But you're trying the theme of it is you're just creating your character, mm -hmm. um, buying equipment for them, um, and everything has abilities. Some of the swords will let you, or certain equipment will let your dice do different things and everything. Mm -hmm. And it, plus, when you place a dice, there's an ability that lets you alter other dice or change mm -hmm. dice spots and everything so there's that's how you can deal with the Randomness. Uh, that, that, that yeah that that lets you have a little bit of dice manipulation uh if in case you're getting screwed over by fletcher rolls <laughs> is what i'll call them <laughs> it's, it's really cool because well actually i like this game best at two because of that placing the dice in the different attribute slots the, the abilities with that because when you start with more people you actually have more of your attributes filled out, so yes. that's less actions you'll get. I like having those actions. Yes. So with two or one, you have more empty slots, so mm -hmm. you have more uh, chances to use it. Yeah, and it, there's, it plays one. There's a solo official solo variant with mm -hmm. this game that lets you run through. Works awesome. Yeah. Um, oh, the uh, I was gonna say Max versus Minions. The Monsters and Minions expansion also added those like high dice. Yeah, that are three like, to eight. Three to eight. Yep. Yeah, they're, but they don't have any color. They're they're kind of like a clear, yeah. translucent. So they don't count towards any of the color bonuses of your dice. Yeah. But they range from three to eight. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. I I've guess. always been intrigued to to see if you can play this game and take one of those characters and actually build a D and D character from that. There's a. a Going to going towards there's some formula that they've been messing with to be able to use that for the role player the adventures, adventures. okay um, so I don't know yeah I don't know they're they're gonna have to you tweak know. it because I mean because none of the attributes require you to have like 18s across the board otherwise you'd be broken starting out but it's like I bet you could I I feel like you could uh, none of the equipment or I'm anything the rock like <laughs> you can just start like because. Yeah, role player is really good. It was my um, uh, forty two. Yeah, so but it's 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 a solid dice dice drafting game. Awesome. My number six. I don't remember where um, you, this game was at for you, or if it was even on your on your list at all. Uh, it was number eight last year, so it rose two spots, and it was number four uh, the year before. And that's this war of mine. So this, at the time of this recording, is the highest Awaken Realms game uh, on my list. Uh, so this war of mine is... Uh, it was 76. 76. I feel like it's I haven't high. played it that much. Yeah. So this war of mine is a game where you are playing a survivor in a war-torn city. Uh, it actually came from a video game. Which was I, I have played the video game. I think the board game's way better. You feel more involved. The the mm -hmm. video game feels kind of more abstract. But essentially what you're doing is controlling the four characters, uh, and you're having them do different actions throughout throughout the house, gather resources to be able to uh, you know, build, you know, a heater or something like that, so you can combat the cold, but you have to have wood to put into the heater or books. <laughs> um and so that that staves off the cold that that will accumulate. Uh, you can have them, you know, build a bed so they can sleep. And if they sleep, then they're not fatigued. But everything is done simultaneous with these characters. No one controls one character. Everyone kind of controls all of them. And whenever you are assigning them, then like because you have day fate, you have different phases. Do the through the day is when they're doing their actions, but they're only limited. Or they're limited by their actions depending on how tired, sick, wounded, miserable they are. And so those, if then they'll accumulate all these different uh, conditions that you're also trying to manage because the game, the game is, is a very dark game. It was, it made my top 10, um, uh, not, not horror themes, but like dark themes because it's just, it, it is a depressing reality. Right. And, Whenever you are doing these actions and you go to the evening phase, so then you have to decide who's going to go out and, and you know, to these different locations that if they're close, medium, or far, then you have less less cards and less things to try and gather things. 
Um, so whenever you are, if you go to another location, you might have a special events there. It might be a market that you can do a special action to be to trade or visit so you can carry uh, items that, hey, well, we're not really using that shotgun. We don't have any ammo, so let's try and trade it because it's worth a lot. Right. Um, and your people have a weight limit, but a lot of things, a lot of the resources don't actually have a weight limit, which is nice. But you feel... Like, you, you really feel for these characters because whenever you go out and let's say you have a really bad run, like, you just keep running into your noise or you run into people or uh, or scenarios and it's like, and you come back with nothing, you're like, oh, God, okay, we don't, who the hell are we going to feed? Like I don't like that one guy. Anton? Yeah, it's because he's useless. Yeah, because he's the one that bitches about everything. He's the one that, yeah, he's if he... He's sad if, about everything. Yeah, he's the one, if he... If he <laughs> God, I hate him so much. He's the mathematician. If he doesn't have a book, then he's miserable. And if, because like they all have like a spirit, like an A, B, and C, <clears throat> and at the end of the round, you draw a certain card, and it'll like resolve everyone's C or B or whatever. Um, and some of them can be good. Most of them are bad because a lot of them are like chain smokers. So it's like if you don't have cigarettes for them, then they're miserable. But Anton. Offers nothing. He's super empathetic. So anytime someone dies, he cries. Um, and high empathy is is actually really bad too because you can have people that come to your doorstep and then it's like, oh, let's let him in. It's like we don't fucking like. Uh, but if he doesn't, if we don't, have, if you don't have a book in your storage, then he's he gets a miserable token. If you do have a book, then he gets fatigued because he stays up all night reading. And it's like, look, Anton. Just fucking gun him down. All right. Oh, now we have enough mouths to feed. And you always have to have one. And, I mean, that's kind of the reality of the of the, the theme, though. It's like, it's like, well, well, Seth, you're heartless. It's like, look, it's strict survival. And if someone's not pulling their weight, I'm not saying kill them. But it's like, get out of the fucking house. Do something or get out. Uh, but And I always end up starting with him because I randomize the people. It's always him. And I never take him out, and I'm like, oh, that's my reality. It's Anton again. So, but yeah, there's just, there's a lot of working mechanics. The one house rule that I've done is that one water is good for everyone, because water is ridiculously hard to get. And so that's kind of the one house rule I've done. There's, and the, the biggest thing is that there's a scenario book that it will give you randomized encounters, and a lot of them are really dark. Some of them might be good. Some of them, based off the decisions that you make, could either go south real quick or or uh, or nowhere at all. It's just, the game is so engrossed in theme. I think this game works the best solo. Uh, they did a really interesting thing with this, though, is they wanted people to buy the game, open it up, and play. Which is good. That's a good thing, because you can do that. You just take the journal book and you just run through it. But, for me... Since it's a survival game and I want to win, I want to know how to win. So you don't have any rules. You find out special things and new actions and things that you can do through the scenario thing. So they're like secret rules. Right. I personally don't like that. I, I would, so I've actually scoured the scenario book for those because it's like, look, this stuff is pivotal to your survival. Why would they hide that? I get why. I just, I'm really glad they don't do that anymore because I, I really didn't care for that i think it's cool in theory but yeah the scenarios are super dark i mean there was one where it's like we saw like a boy this is kind of a spoiler but there's like two thousand scenarios so one was like we saw a boy whose whose dog ran into a sewer um and we could decide to go get it or we could leave it alone and we decided to send someone in and uh unfortunately the dog got like skewered by uh, like some like busted up rusted pipe uh, so that was depressing, but the person going into the sewer ended up getting sick from it. So it's like, when, the one time we try to help someone and it goes south for us. Uh, yeah, and it's I can talk on and on about this game, but if you want a really gritty solo experience about survival, this is probably one of the best ones out there. So this War of Mine was my number six. Yeah, my number six was number 17 last year, not on the list the year before that. <clears throat> and that is Raiders of the North Sea. That's right. I remember you saying this was in your top yes. ten. Raiders of the North Sea is... Why? Is not my highest Viking game. <laughs> um, <clears throat> why is this... 
you said you like this better than Architects, right? Oh yeah. You haven't played Paladins, right? Huh. Um, I don't get it. It's I just <laughs> I just like the simple mechanic of because it's worker placement. You'll you'll only ever have one worker in your pool, and you place a worker, you pick up a worker, right? So you get you're taking two actions every turn mm-hmm. instead of just placing taking one action wait until your next right. turn and stuff. So you're getting two actions, but it also brings in the strategy of of you don't want to necessarily take away one that you know that somebody else has the right color to put down there to mm. do that action too. You need it. Yeah. So that it brings in strategy, and then it also turns into a bit of a race as well because you're you're going to be raiding. I mean that's how you pretty much move win. the game on and win <laughs> yeah. is your, the whole bottom half of the board is you getting the resources to go raiding and then when you go raid is when you can start picking up the the white um, the white uh, meeples because you start off with black I believe and then black and gray are what you mess mm-hmm. with down here and then white is what you start picking up to yeah. do stronger actions down here Vice versa. There was one, I think, weren't they like, <coughs> weren't they like Valkyries or something, which moved you up a track, which got you a shit ton of points? Yeah, because uh, um, at the beginning of the game, when you set up, you have to draw out these, these the rewards for when you raid, mm-hmm. and it'll be like gold or food or wood, whatever, mm-hmm. but then there's also the, like the black Valkyrie tokens. Okay. Um, so if you raid there and take it, then you have to kill off because you'll have a crew that you'll have picked up of Vikings throughout the deal. You'll have to kill off however many of those for however many Valkyries, but then you move up on the Valkyrie track, which the higher you're up on that glory track is more victory points. Yeah. So And it's like a significant amount of victory points. Right, too. so you want to kind of your people to be kind of dying off and you replacing them. So you get points from that, you get points from your strength that mm-hmm. you gain, you get points just from points. Um, and it's just, I mean, it's it's a simple game. And the expansions add um, some more tug-of-war aspects and some more places to go and get some, get the Fields of Fame and the uh, Hall of Heroes. Mm-hmm. Um, just add more options, more uh, uh, character cards, stuff like that, more places for you to do your worker. I think the reason it's up here, theme, I like the theme, but then also the... Uh, just being able to you drop pick up mm-hmm. you know it it lets you uh, it's quicker to set up your moves like if you're like okay I need to get this and this to be able to go up and raid that you're mm-hmm. getting it faster because sure. you're dropping and picking up you're getting two sets of stuff instead of some games where you, you're going to put a worker here yeah. and wait till your turn put a worker here and hope that it doesn't get taken <laughs> yeah that's you know true. what I'm saying so it's like um it's just a unique take on deck on, on uh, worker placement, and that's that's why it's super easy to teach as well. All right, and, and really quick, the solo variant is oh yeah wonderful. There's solo variants. I mean, I've only played the yes. solo variant for paladins, but it was it's really good too. So yep, awesome. I'm intrigued. Oh, you'll probably still like raiders if you like it for the simplicity simplicity of it. Then you'll probably still like it better than paladins. But I have a feeling you might. I like Dark Knights too. Yeah, our, our, I mean, and paladins. I'm interested because I hear here it's his deepest one. It is. So it is based on what I'm hearing. I've played raiders, haven't played architects, but based on what I understand from architects, it's definitely it's yeah. more uh, strategic one. Awesome. My number five is my second and last new one on the list. And that is a Vila Lasarda game called CO2. Second Chance. I have not played the the first chance. So Second Chance, from what I understand, actually makes it cooperative. Um, theme of this game is global warming. So and it's Second Chance because you have a uh, so you have one last chance to try and try and revert global warming. Um, not gonna make any freaking agenda stance here. I don't care to argue with people in the comments whether they believe it or not. Uh, but this game is absolutely fantastic and so grounded in theme. Um, might be at this point my favorite Vita Lasarda game that I've played, which is, uh, I've played three of his now. So CO2, Escape Plan, and On Mars. And On Mars is really damn close too. But uh, CO2 is just, it's just awesome. The cooperative nature of it, of trying to decide what types of plants that you're gonna, that you're wanting to, wanting to build, um, whether you want to do solar, uh, solar, wind, uh, uh, hydro, 
forestation, all of them have, and, and recycling, and all of them have like a difficulty of which one to build, forestation being the hardest plant to actually do, but it gives you the most bang for your buck. Um, and each of the continents have requirements of what they're kind of kind of needing, and if you don't meet those requirements, then they'll revert back to fossil fuels for energy. So let's say North America wanted solar and hydro, and you're like, okay, well we can do that, we can meet that because they they have the most emissions that they're, you're trying to uh, to meet. So we'll meet that, and then oh well, we didn't really hit Africa. They they wanted recycling, we didn't give them one. So then you draw from a stack of tokens that's like, okay, well they went to coal. That's going to add thirty on your mission. And so as you're increasing your knowledge and your plant plant production, your tracks go up on all of them, which then will give you points. And essentially your points will go back, like you'll you'll meet uh like you'll go negative and you as long as you don't go below zero, then you're good. And each round you're gonna do a little bit better. So Ooh. you really have to think like you cannot think okay just one round you really have to think okay so in the next year in the next you know decade because it starts out sadly enough in 2020 um and in 2030 40 50 uh you really have to be like okay how can we stave off for the next couple rounds because if you really only focus on the now you're gonna lose um and by design Vital even mentioned that you could play perfectly and still lose because it's thematically grounded. It's random, and it has Ooh. happened to me before. Um, so it's not likely. It's not like, oh, well, what's the point? But this game is very, very difficult. You have objective cards that you're trying to meet that will give you uh, that will give you points. You have summits they are, that you're also sending. So your workers that you're placing are, if you, you have to place them in a factory, and then once you move them from that factory, they can only go to a summit that matches that factory because that's right. what they thematically know about. It's like, well, I worked in a solar plant, so why the hell would I go to Forest Station? I don't know any of that. Um, you have tokens that you're trying to meet where it's like, okay, we need two Forest Station out, so then that token gets flipped. And once those are all flipped over, because the face-up ones will be negative points, um, so you're trying to do away with as many of those. There's just everything, like a Vito Lasar, the game, is everything is connected to one another. There's no... No action or no mechanic that you're like, well, that's kind of out of nowhere. Everything just makes sense. The game can be played competitively. I have never played it that way. I like the idea of working together as uh, as players. Um, although it's weird, they have the mechanic where it's like you can't talk about what's in your hand, and I, I always thought that was weird. But but yeah, CO2 was just incredibly thematically grounded, and because of the theme because it's more real for me that's why it edges out on mars um but his games man i'm just, i'm telling you like i just get super aroused every time i i see one i'm like ooh, is that beatles game <laughs> it's like man i'm i'm a little weird right now but yeah it's vital <laughs> ooh, lasarda but yeah his uh i i mean from playing escape plan which is also really good that's his lightest game. This one's really heavy, really difficult. On Mars is competitively difficult. Uh, I want to try Lisboa. I want to try Vinos. I want to try. I have Galaris over there. I had a friend that listened, that watches your channel. Oh, he that, hates it. <laughs> that uh, he wanted me to say it's it's Vital. Oh, is it Vital Lacerta? Oh, Vital. okay. All right. Is that better, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> I will keep that in mind, and I will not correct myself. <laughs> I'm stubborn. I mean, I, that's that's just how I've always heard it was Beetle. Beetle. Yeah, I know. It's just like... Has he met him? I don't know. Does he, does he know Beetle? I doubt it. <laughs> so He lives in Joplin. Well, I'm going to have to go beat him up. <laughs> going to correct me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so CO2 Second Chance is my number five. All right. My number five is... Well, oh, but actually, hold on real quick. Thank you for watching my channel. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, he's a good guy. Um, he's a principal at a middle school. God, that sounds so pretentious. It's Vital. That's like people who say... <laughs> I wish I had his text pulled up. It's like, <laughs> hey, make sure to tell him that he's Vital, a fucking idiot you know? and he's pronouncing it wrong. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like people... Because I, I pronounce aunt, aunt. And like it's like, oh, yes, your majesty, aunt. And it's like Vital. Yeah, this is funny. But actually, he he commented on my on Mars discussion. He says, "Tell Seth, tell Seth is pronounced 
Vital. Oh, okay. I just watched his CO2 video, and he was sending pictures of On Mars. Oh, good deal. <laughs> on Mars is really, really good. Yeah. And, I mean, really, I think for both CO2 and On Mars, because On Mars isn't on the top 100 because I had, hadn't played right. it by the time, um, it's like splitting hairs, literally. Like, On Mars, it's like mechanically, I think I like it better, but CO2 is a more real theme that I'm more invested mm -hmm. in. Right. So, yeah, it's... God. And I think Lisboa is where Vital is from, and so it's like the the building up of that town or city, I think. can't remember. Someone commented, and I can't remember what he said the theme was about, but... Yeah, I'm just... I'm enamored with all of his games. I will, Even though I have Viticulture, I'll probably give Vinos just because oh, it's yeah, a Vital, sure. Vital Lasarda game. Is it <laughs> Vital gonna... Lasarda? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so... All right. Uh, my number five uh, was number seven last year, uh, and was was not on the list the year before. From Greenbrier Games, it's Folklore: The Affliction. Um, yes. No, I mean that's fine. That's that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> um, the, the game's good. the game's good. I hated it for a while because when you go three players, it's very, oh no, it's, yeah, it's almost impossible. So yeah. whenever we picked it up again with the fourth player, like I, I'm yeah, playing two characters, it, uh, we were having so much fun. Yeah, I play it solo pretty much exclusively, and I run it with two characters. Oh really? Okay. Um, yeah, I feel like two me controlling two characters. That's yeah. how I play it. It's yeah. Um, and. Uh, I'm excited for the, the, the new stuff to come out, um, mainly because I want the big storage box yes. to put everything in. Um, oh, this is going to be so nice. Yeah, but Folklore, it's, it is a non-traditional uh, horror RPG kind of game because it takes like European fairy tale horror almost, not and not fairy tale like Three Little Pig yeah. shit, but it's like... The monsters that they the parents try to frighten their kids with, yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it's European, like it's stuff that mm -hmm. no, we aren't necessarily common around here, right? You know? um, but uh, you you take on these roles of these characters that aren't your normal. They're not like barbarian, wizard, you know, thief crap. It's like you're a, a butcher, you're a, a scientist, a, a scientist, or a, a demonologist, or not a demon hunter. Yep. Or just all these, like, really... The enchant Enchantress? Uh, I think there's one. There's the Illusionist. Illusionist. That's the one I was thinking I of. know the four. There's Exorcist. The four we play is Exorcist, uh, Witch Hunter, Illusionist, and Madman. Right. So Avenging Madman. There's just a bunch of weirds. But, but, but what's cool is when you pick one of these these classifications, then at the very beginning that you choose, there's two different versions of that character. And however you choose at the very beginning will decide what their skill tree is going to look like. Mm -hmm. um, so then you can really personalize your stuff. When you, it's a kind of an open world game, you're following a story, mm -hmm. but you don't have to like you can go just randomly wander off to a town if you want or whatever if you want. Yeah. Um, but uh, you when you go to shop at a town, you only certain people can do certain things. Mm -hmm. You know, like so. Not every place of a town, not every store is going to be available to the witch hunter. You mm -hmm. know, there may be a certain thing that they can buy that somebody else can't. Yeah. Um, there's a, the whole day and night deal. So, like, when you're moving and from place to place, if you stay on the road and you move, you'll pull a road event, whether it's day or night. Mm -hmm. And if you go off-road... They have day and night off road, and those are usually pretty heinous. Um, <laughs> it gets pretty nasty yeah, out there. Yeah, they're pretty gross. Um, but you get to your places a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. um, so, what is cool about this is like when you die, if you've gotten the miniatures for it, you have you, they actually have blue translucent characters of your the exact same mold of your character. So you're in ghost, you're a ghost of yourself. Mm -hmm. If you die as a ghost, then you're in limbo, and you, there's ways to get you back. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's just a crazy game, you know. And and, and um, they have little dual type battles. Um, what do they call them? Skirmish. Skirmish. That's the word I was looking for. Where it's just pretty much you just place the card down and you're rolling percentage dice and mm -hmm. and stuff trying to hit them. It, it it is it's a fiddly, a little bit of a fiddly. Oh yeah, game. yeah, without a doubt. But that's fine. I mean, I I I'm I'm good with it. That's gonna be kind of your Ameritrash game anyway. Right. Um, if you can delegate like 
roles of who manages what. Like, since I'm now controlling two characters, I have my friend Devin. He controls the monsters mm-hmm. instead of me doing everything. So that alleviates a lot of it. Um, but, like, there's a lot of things in Folklore that no other RPG game does that I think adds to the uniqueness of mm-hmm. Folklore. Because most games la- are like that. They're like, oh, well, we'll just take that out. And it's like... Right. So it, it is nice and different enough. Yeah. And then some of the battles, you know, will scale down. Mm-hmm. So like a thick video game where it scales down and zooms in on your characters. Because on the world map, you're just a little white meeple and that's, yeah. that's your whole party yeah. as you move around. But then like, if you have an encounter, you'll it'll tell you what tile to put out and it's a gridded tile. And then mm-hmm. you actually put all the miniatures out and then it becomes a tactical uh, miniatures battle. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's cool in that case. And then, like we've said before on other lists, they put the names on the bottom of every one of their damn miniatures. So that's a uh, it kind of, it's it's awesome. I mean, because some so many games miniatures they start looking a lot like I I look at your your KDM stuff mm-hmm. and like I couldn't tell you what's what. But if they just put on the very bottom of the miniature, this is the yeah you know whatever yeah oh look the, 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 this is the oh. naked this is the naked siren. <laughs> 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 it's like oh thank god all right. right oh i see the boobs now so yeah so you know it's just uh they've taken a lot of you know because i think i got in on the second kickstarter because i didn't yep. do the first one um and there was the third one that's brought so right now there's gonna be four after this next kickstarter comes through there's gonna be four story books out um uh, uh there's a creator where you can create your own yep scenarios and everything yep. it's just there's a ton of content for this game, and it's it's a unique RPG adventure style game, and it's, it's dark too. Yeah, it is dark dark, dark, dark fantasy. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's it is a lot of fun, very fiddly, but ultimately, I think you can overcome it. The fiddly is worth it. I mean, for solo play too, sure. Because you're not worried, you're not sitting there watching other people fiddle around. Just right. You're doing everything. And right. You just kind of go and it's, right. Yep. Awesome. My number four is a game that you had mentioned in the last segment. Um, was number 15 last year, so rose 11 spots uh, and did not exist in 2017. And that is... Terraforming Mars? Dinosaur Island. Oh, okay. <laughs> Terraforming Mars, I, I can't remember, remember what, what that was for me. Uh, that was... 18. Gotcha. Dinosaur Island, for everything that you had mentioned, uh, is... Uh, I mean, I, I completely agree. It's It's a fantastic amalgamation of four different games that that cohesively work together as one and you're building a dinosaur park like that's it's it's kind of like a, a 90s jurassic park kind of groovy game the slap bracelet. yeah with the, the first marker. player marker is a slap bracelet <laughs> uh which is just it's so that's so funny um but the totally liquid expansion uh is also really cool not needed but uh sure like makes the game even more richer because it adds it's a modular expansion the biggest one is the the water creatures which don't give you like a lot of like points but they attract a lot of people so but they also have high security so you have to you know weigh your you weigh your options here but yeah you're managing with like income that you need to use to buy more buildings or increase your security or hire specialists um you need to draft certain DNA dice to be able to increase it, so you can then build your your schematics essentially that you're that you're drafting. Um, you have so many options of of how you want to play because you can either try and go for high attraction because the more people that you pull from the bag, hey, that's good because that's going to be more money and I have more slots to place them. But at the same time, if you don't manage your security, then they're going to start getting eaten and you'll lose you'll lose points that way. It's just, I mean, this is another 10 out of 10 for me because I really have no no negative, like, I can't think of anything negative about this game. Yeah. Um, like, it's just, it, it, it works so well. And like you mentioned, if you're teaching it, because if it was if it was just one game, like, if, if this was just, like, one board, it'd be overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Um, nothing that people can't overcome, but the fact that it is broken up into four different phases you can teach those four individual phases one at a time and people can still make their decision. You don't have to sit there and coddle them throughout the entire game. Right. You just be like, all right, well, here's this one. Then this one, this one, this one. Okay, 
and then do we want to start over? And, and most of the time, everyone's like, oh, I'm actually pretty happy with my decisions. I get it. And then you, boom, like, yep. you, you just get it. Pandasaurus, this kind of put them on the map, I think. Uh, so I'm excited for their other Kickstarter that they're about to do called Godspeed. So that could be really cool. But Dinosaur Island is just one I'll always have in my collection and just shot up to the top just by, I mean, expansion content. I mean, they have, like, one where it's a T-Rex, like a giant T-Rex you can build. Um, special, like, amusement rides and things like that. So just even more content that the base game didn't even need. Like, the base game was fine by itself. But, right. hey, it's just more. Why not? So that's my number four, Dinosaur Island. All right. My number four was number two the last two years. Okay. And that is Five Tribes. Gotcha. Oh, okay. Um, it slid mainly because I haven't played it mm -hmm. um, as much. Not because I don't like it anymore. It right. Just hit the tables. Man, as from much. two to four, man, you might yeah, as well I just know. throw it away. Yep. <laughs> uh, five Tribes. I, I. It's been on your list. You, you. I think you said it. Uh. Yeah. I think it was on my list. About it a La few tens ago. Yep. Um. But uh. Five Tribes is the. Is a Mancala uh, game full of AP, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, pretty much you're laying out a grid of tiles, and all the tiles have special abilities. And on each of those tiles, you're putting, I believe, five meeples on each tile. So, yeah. um, and then you, when it's your turn, you're gonna pick up all the meeples off of one tile, and you're going to set one down on each tile and you got to keep going until you get the last one and when you get the last one there has to be a, at least one matching the last meeple you're setting down and then you take all of that color of that last meeple and you get to do either collect them or do the do the action of that color whatever it may be um the red one if you pick up three red ones on that last tile then you get to take out a meeple three up to three tiles away um, if at any time you, you're taking the last meeples off of a tile, then you get to lay claim to that tile, and it is yours, so you get the victory points for it at the end of the game. Um, it's it's such it's such a good game because there's set yeah. collection, there's there's um, you can recruit gins that are super powerful that'll let you score points or do special things to get to allow you to score more points. As you go, um, the first expansion that came out added the purple uh, meeples, um, and then it added the the mountains and the and the uh, cavern or mm -hmm. the cliff or whatever. So it made it you know a little more strategic. So you couldn't. It's hard to kind of get in the middle of the mountains because the way they have you set up the board, the mountains are always kind of in those middle mm -hmm. middle few. Um, and the treasures, right? Yeah, the treasures for the purples, like yep. you. You, when you picked up the purples, you'd get to let's see. You, you, think you, you drew kept them because the purples would collect. Yeah, and then you get to draw. I like think if tokens. You up, if you picked up three purples, mm -hmm. then you'd get to pick up three of those tokens and pick one yep. that you wanted and, and discard the others or whatever. But those are worth victory points or whatever. More I mean, there's just a bunch of different yeah. stuff, right? It's um, and the thing, and I know this is one of the things you like about it is the. Is your money is one for one with victory points. Yep. So there's an auction phase for turn order, which turn order is important in a game like this because, you know, there may be a primo move that's going to get you a big tile that you see because what the reason I said there's a lot of AP is because if you're going fourth in a four player game and you look and see that nine chances out of ten, your move's not going to be valid mm -hmm. by the time it comes to your turn because the board is going to have changed and and stuff so you're going to auction so you may wager 10 coins just to go first but that's 10 victory points you're losing at the end of the game so you need to make sure whatever you're fighting for is worth it um, because at the end of the game you just tally up all your victory points the victory points the tiles and any like uh, the, the palm trees and palaces that you have out mm -hmm. there and then it's your number of coins and your set because your sets right at any time you can sell um, your sets, your sets right, for yeah. coins, but I mean, it's just to kind of make it right, you know. But 
But anyway, I mean, Five Tribes, you know, they've come out with several expansions for it. I mm -hmm. really haven't messed with the newest expansion. Rims of the Sultan is really uh, cool. It adds, much. it gives you a more claim and makes the, the area control kind of more appealing. Because mm -hmm. if you control multiple cities, that's a lot of victory points. Right. Um, and then the Sultan cards. So those are, those are really good, too. Yeah, so, I mean, this is one of those games that's just a... It's just the beast. It's, yeah. it's awesome. Don't let the uh, Mancala mechanic... Yeah. Because that's always what kept me away from it. And I was like, really, Mancala? But, yeah, the game is really, really good. Awesome. My number three was number three last year. Um, and did not exist in 2017. And this is... What did I say? Survival of this War of Mine was the best survival game? Mm -hmm. I lied. Seventh Continent is the oh, best man. survival game. They're different in... in mechanics and, and theme. Um, I would probably say this War of Mine is the better survival game, but Seventh Continent, by God, is the best exploration game. Uh, see, I'm so mad. I'm just throwing my... I'm so, I'm so passionate about Seventh Continent. Uh, like, no game... Like, Seventh Continent is absolutely unique uh, on its own. And another game that came out this year, Tainted Grail, does something similar to it, but not to the extent of what Seventh Continent brings to the table, which is cards. Like, it's just a bunch, a bunch of cards. And you have, I want to say there's like 10 curses that would, if you have, I have the, all the Kickstarter stuff for it. I think there's like 10 curses total. I haven't even completed one of them because they're all exploration base so the first one is your like the theme is that you're going back to the seventh continent uh, which is like this mysterious island that you are uh trying to to lift a curse off yourself at least that's the first one that i'm doing um and what you do is you you have these meeples and you're you're moving from from card to card uh facing challenges so whenever you start on a tile that tile has cards and there's different fog around it that is like a something that you have to achieve to get to the next area um and on this card are just different little icons that you're like oh okay well i want to i see um you know uh, eggs over there so i'm gonna go check that out then it tells you to find a certain card so then you find the card and it's like oh it was actually you know uh, a squid nest and now you're being attacked by a squid and since you were the only one doing it then you have to fight it off. And it does a really neat mechanic in that your exhaustion and how and your successes, because it's star-based, you have to get a certain number of stars to pass like any type of skill, is you decide how much energy you want to exert. And you have a deck of action cards. And they're all face down. And you can be like, it, the rulebook tells you if you need four stars, then you have 80% chance of getting four stars by drawing seven cards or, or something like that. Right. So... You can decide, okay, I want to exert four four cards. Like, that's what I think might actually work. Uh, and so you draw four, and then if you get... There's full stars and there's half stars that you can put together to create one. And if you get the required amount, then you succeed. You, you meet, you do the succeed. If you don't get it, there's a fail. That could give you statuses like you're, you're cut, you're bleeding, you're poisoned, all that, which are just bad because over time, these cards will start taking a toll and start releasing more of these blue action cards and once that deck runs out you don't lose but you shuffle it and there's curse cards in in this deck you shuffle it and now whenever you are doing actions you don't draw from the top anymore you draw randomly from that deck and if you draw a curse card you lose gotcha now typically this does kind of like that groundhog day kind of okay well if you lose you start over from that tile Mm. I don't do that because I hate that groundhog mechanic. I don't want to start over, so I just keep going. Uh, but to each their own. I, I mean, that's I'm cheating, I guess. But yeah, just the sheer amount of exploration in this game is is amazing. There's so many cards, so many neat ideas. Where it's like when you save the game, one of the best save systems I've seen in a board game. Easy to do because it's all cards. But you come back, and then whenever you're traveling, there's multiple cards of certain numbers. So you might actually come across something that you haven't before because the world is changing. And with the the second you know expansion, the what goes up must come down, it adds weather. And weather might change the way mm -hmm. that tiles react. And you can actually get into a hot air balloon that takes you above. And now you have white cards that are you explore you know, above. And then it's just... This, this game, I am just 
super enamored by everything that that it offers like the crafting is while not super thematic is really innovative as well because there are they look like dice but they're actually just markers of your durability so if you have an item that you craft by being on a tile that has a certain icon then it's like oh to craft this it's only going to cost one card so you just spend the one card and you you make it and that gives you like additional stars for certain actions and some of them might even be like like for example if you're like oh we need to cross this river and that gives us card 13 but i have right. this raft that adds a five to it so now i find card 18 and you'll get to a different location or you'll have a different experience depending on particular items it's just it's amazing i absolutely love this game um i mean it was my number three last year mm -hmm. stayed at number three i it's I I can't see it ever really moving because there's so much to it. Like I mentioned, there's a shit ton of curses, and I've only I haven't even finished one. And there's actually uh, well I'm not gonna ruin too much because it is expiration. But one other neat thing about this game is that the cards aren't just there just for artwork and things like that. There's actually sometimes hidden numbers and tracks and things. So what's the art is relevant. You can look at it and be like, oh, there's actually a secret eleven here, and you find eleven, and it's like. Uh, an animal burrow and now you can go hunt because you happen to track these animals and there's just a bunch of different things that are in this game that I I love it so it's my number three yes, seventh continent I, I I mean it's one of those games that you can play with other people but the turns yeah. are so free flowing that mm -hmm. it's like might as well just play it by yourself right. I play that max two mm -hmm. so yeah all right uh, my number three was number four last year. And was number 11 the year before that. And it's my other Viking game. Champions of Midgard. Okay, I was like, I don't know which I... Because you <laughs> yeah. mentioned Blood Rage. Okay. Uh, Champions of Midgard. Hey, I can actually contribute yeah, to yeah. this. It still sucked. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's... Base game by itself was what was on... It was on this list and what bumped it up, I think, from that 11 to... Mm -hmm. Three now. Dark, the Dark it, Mountain. No, the, 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 the having the Valhalla in there. Yeah. It's just that having that little added. Um, I'm okay with my with my uh, berserkers dying because then mm -hmm. I'm going to have some berserker tokens to be able to buy Valhalla stuff. You mm -hmm. know, because some, some of that Valhalla stuff is pretty. It is really good. Pretty yeah. Good. You know, and 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 uh, so just adding that little bit of an extra. The Dark Mountain is just more spots for you to go and basically. Someplace yeah, I mean, that you, yeah. that's where you get your archers and yeah. stuff from up there, which are better for hunting. Yeah, for food. I mean, yeah, I it, mean, I guess they are also better for combat because there's yeah. only one blank on them. Right. But so, yeah, I mean, they're mainly used for hunting. That one, I I play with them all. Well, especially yeah. now since I have to play Matt. That yeah, just we we did too. Out, but, Dark Mountain's not bad. Yeah, it's, it's just, just more of the same. Yeah, I guess it's actually, it might even be a little bit better because you don't have to pay for a boat. Right. I mean, you still might have that. Yeah, they're they're a little event. less powerful. You have the mountain events before you take on mm -hmm. the They usually monsters. require gold. Yeah. Right. Um, but, but the Valhalla expansion is what I think pushes it way over. Yeah. And, I, and that's what everybody has, that's kind of the consensus, I think. But anyway, uh, with, with Champions of Midgard, is it's worker placement, the Viking placement. <laughs> um, yeah, and you're gaining dice and resources to ultimately go sailing or hiking <laughs> <it's> <laughs> the mountain now to go kill monsters yep. or fight the trolls or um, the droggers or whatever they um, and so there's randomness in dice rolls. So if you don't like dice. Sorry. Yeah, right. there's it's, no. It's I just realized really, there's no mitigation. Right. You roll it. You. But Valhalla as that leader. Right. Man. Yeah. The the lead having the leader token is big because they don't necessarily die when they. No. Go, you can you get have back. to buy Valhalla stuff right. to get them back. Right. But yeah, everyone has um, every player has their own unique leadership right. thing. But you go through and and um, I haven't played Reavers enough to really. Get yeah, a super no feel idea. on it. I still like. I mean, this is still, I think, the better game after playing both of them. But, but um, you have your you have some secret objective, not objective, some secret scoring cards that mm -hmm. you can pick up as well as you go through. Um, and it's a it's it's a victory point game. Mm -hmm. Um, the probably Gray Fox's best game they've made. Uh, 
Yes. Like from from yes. the games that I've played from there, the latest ones was London Dread. That one was okay. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, War of the Worlds, which I felt was unbalanced. Well, and they also did Deception Mirror, Hong Kong. They oh yeah. Done. They. Uh, yeah, Deception's a good one. Completely different game from <laughs> from this. Yeah, one, yeah. Though. yeah. But anyway, uh, this this world. Um, there's a third game going to be coming out in this world. Really? They did Champions of Midgard, which was your whole dice mm -hmm. fest. Um, Reavers was more, almost a little bit more Euro-y okay. kind of in a way. Apparently, this third one is going to be the biggest pile of Ameritrash mm. thrown in. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Um, my, me and my friend are actually have been working on a deck builder in this world that we were really pit pitched to him. Oh, neat. So anyway, we'll see. But but anyway, uh, so Champions of Midgard, it's, 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 if you don't like dice, like I said, it, you're, you're probably, you're like, you can get screwed by dice in this game. Yep. But if you have Valhalla, at least you're getting something out of your dice. Exactly. I mean, that's yep. the big thing. So you're getting hosed by dice isn't going to be a, a, a game ender mm -hmm. before you know. In fact, there might be times where you're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll send some on purpose, mm -hmm. and then when some die, those would be I'll you know yep. kill off those. So you I can think get the, the tokens for them. Valhalla expansion added the berserkers and the shield guys, right? Yeah, yeah, yep. And then yeah, it's it was uh, the berserkers and the uh, shield maidens, mm -hmm. and then the uh, archers came in the the dark, dark mountain. mountain. But um, but yeah, it's it's. I'll play. It's it's just a great game, and I mean, yeah. and you you'd play it two player for the longest time, and I hated and it. Didn't like two. just the troll. Yep. So then deal. played it uh, like last week with three, and like it significantly better. Now I will say I still don't like that troll mechanic. Yeah. Strictly for the fact that it's like you give blame to someone for it's like well I didn't even get the option to try. Right. But. The blame is not that bad. I think by the end of it, especially Valhalla, At the max it's twenty points off. If if you have every blame token maxed out, yeah, that's the most you can lose. Yeah, so um, I won't even try. But like, I think, uh, but like with the Valhalla expansion, there were multiple ways to for those cards to even get rid of some. Mm -hmm. uh, you, but like, I think by the end of it, Cat had one. Uh, my friend Devin had like four and I had three. Yeah. And that's like minus five points, six points. Most and one. of the time we play, everybody pretty much has six. Really? And then everybody's max. So it's all, oh, so flushed. it's it's a wash, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that's why I said the troll just doesn't make a yeah. difference. It's at, just, at I mean, point. It, it's just, yeah. And But in a two player game, it's very, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. So, yeah, yeah and the, the thing that, uh, funny enough, because to speak to praise to it, is a, my friend Devin, he's not a huge fan of work replacement. He likes them, but he's like, he never really wants to come back to them. He's like, yeah, that was good, but I don't want to play it again. Uh, he said he would play Champions of Midgard mm -hmm. again, and I mean, he, man, he was getting hosed on those sea events, because he was kept going out, and then there was one where he sent out, like, the one person. Well, the Kraken, he actually got, and he killed it, but it was, like, one person, oh, he sent, like, two people in a food, and because the the first two locations, one food feeds two people, right. and he got like lost, so he had to get rid of either a food or a person. Yeah. And he's like, so or no, it was two food and and like and or uh, two of one thing. So he's like, so pretty much, I just it was a wipe. I'm like, yeah. And every single time I went out there, I always got like all clear. Yeah. And actually, there was one I found a, a <coughs> abandoned ship, so I got money. But I told him I was like. Well, I kept going to the Destiny place to get the Destiny, and it let me look yeah, at them. Yeah, that's what so. I was going to say. You, you can peek, you know. It's yeah, and, it, and with the Dark Mountain, you can look at either the Sea Ones or those. Mm -hmm. And I never really went after the, the mountains like or the trolls. No, giants. Giants was what they were. And I was like, never really felt a need for it. Um, but, yeah, I the, the game is, is really good. Just never play with two. Yep. Yep, yep. Awesome. My number two was number two last year and was also not on the list in 2017, and that is Gloomhaven. So, Gloomhaven... I know you're number one now. Huh? I know you're of number course. One. Of course. <laughs> it's... Hero Realms. Uh, so, Gloomhaven is... Whenever you talk about 
you know, fantasy RPG, I think it's it's absolutely one of the best. Um, like it's kind of your Euro Euro campaign game um, set in a in a unique world with unique characters that you play as that have their own completely unique deck and unique way of leveling up. It it truly feels like you are a, a, a different character when playing. Um, but at its heart, it's it's a dungeon crawl. Like there are over ninety. Well, with the expansion now, there's like 120 scenarios that you can go to, but you won't do them all. You will, uh, depending on the choices that you make and the and the routes that you want to take, you'll you'll, you know, cut off some of the ones that you can no longer do. Um, slight legacy aspects because you'll you'll write on like the main board, which will you know for your prosperity, and that's how well you do, and that gives you the higher prosperity, the more items you can buy. But you'll place stickers to show locations that you can go to, and I really like that aesthetically because you have that blank map, and then you put colorful stickers on it. So it's like, oh, hey, this is where I can go. This is what I've done. Um, so it's just, it's uh, like, it. Now there are some decisions that they've made that as I play it more and more, then I'm like, why? that It doesn't quite make sense to me. It doesn't break the game at all. Still a 10 out of 10, but I'm like... Like, sometimes your items, like, I have an axe that is a consumable. Mm -hmm. Like, I, and I'm like, what? How's that? I'm like, what, how, did I just, okay, don't need this anymore till after the fight. It's just weird. Um, one of the other ones is that you have to physically spend cards to loot, which I get when you're fighting. But, like, afterwards, like, if you, if you don't pick them up, you don't pick them up. And the other one, same with loot, is you don't share. Right. You can't share money. So... It's, so those are things that are kind of weird to me, and I've been trying to see if I can tweak it. If, like, okay, well, if I kill all enemies, then I can just willingly pick up this loot. Um, I don't think that would break the game any, because you're still limited by your prosperity on items that you can buy, and you're also limited by how many items you can carry. So it's not like I'm just going to have a whole bunch of weapons on me. Um, but the thing that makes this game sing is the is something that you don't like, but is praised by everyone is the hand management. So every character, unlike a, uh, a lot of games where you have a deck of cards that you draw from, you have all your cards available to you. So if you're playing the um, the Brute, you have 10 cards. And these 10 cards, you pick two of them and uh, to pair up, and then you it has a top ability and a bottom ability to where you pair up, and then the number on them, it could be your, in the middle is your initiative, and you compare it to everyone's initiative, higher one, or uh, lowest one goes first. So, it's like, whenever you're playing, you're, you're trying to make these awesome combos. Bottom ones usually allow you to move, top ones are usually attacks, but it changes from character to character. But as time goes on, whenever some of them are big time, they get lost, others are just get discarded. And over time, whenever you take a short rest, you take your discarded pile, shuffle it, get rid of one. And that goes into your loss. And over time, your hand becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And usually, uh, every scenario that I've done, like, someone usually ends up becoming exhausted, but it's not till the very end. I've never had both my people, because I play the game solo, I've never had both my people become exhausted. Usually, um, and it's all about hand management. Like, the, the if you want to burn through your, your one-time use cards early on, then yeah, you, you thematically exhausted yourself. So it's like, well, I can't continue. So you have to you have to weigh your options, and that's one of my favorite mechanics. Um, like the ones I was just complaining about with loot and the items, those are just thematic issues I have with it. But mechanic-wise, this game is is perfect for me. The scenarios, even uh, while uh, like dungeon crawl, are still unique and just add to an overarching story. I I think this game is fantastic. So so yeah, I mean, without delving too much. Into the nitty gritty of it, I I love Gloomhaven, and now actually there have been two. I was getting ready to ask if you're gonna dive into Frost. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I think I might just like never mind. I was gonna get real weird. Uh, but Frost Haven, I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna jump into. And here's the thing, like reg like games like this with this expansive world and replayability. This game is only a hundred dollars. Like. This, there's games that are way worse, that are way more expensive. Massive Darkness, for example, Dungeon Crawlers, $300 game for a shit a shithole. Like, here, they went smart. The only minis are your characters. The rest are standees, which mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with standees. Right. So, the one thing that I hope they do better in Frosthaven is tile art. 
Like, the game looks very bland. If I were to see this, it's I'd be like... It's snowy. It's just all white. It's, it's like white, white whiteboards. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then they announced another one. Fuck, what's it called? Um, man, I do not remember what the, they're gonna. He's doing like a like a prequel to Gloomhaven. That's kind of more of an introduction. It's it's not gonna be as like. Deep. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like a simpler way into it. Yes, yes. It's, but it's it's yeah. the the story is gonna be a prequel to what Gloomhaven starts yeah. off as. Uh, not. Founders of Gloomhaven, which no. bombed like immediately because everyone thought it was what the, what the prequel is going to be. But yeah, Gloomhaven, my number two. All right, my number two was number seven two years ago. And wow, then, I know what your number one is. And number three last year, and it is Shadows of Brimstone. Gotcha. <clears throat> yeah. What was it last year? Three. Three. Okay. Yeah. Because what was the one? Oh. The one that was number two last year was Five Tribes, so it, okay. yeah, Five Tribes kind of flipped. Um, but uh, Shadows of Brimstone, it's probably my most uh, community. Uh, what am I? What, oh, that's the word. It takes up the most space. Oh, okay. it's, it's my biggest, expansive. most widely expansive collectible. <laughs> collectible, yes. Um, because so much stuff is out for this game, and I have pretty much everything out for this game currently. Um, I don't even have all the miniatures <coughs> put together yet from the last <laughs> Kickstarter, and I have another Kickstarter coming, maybe, at the end of next year. Damn. Um, but uh, Are they doing another Kickstarter? Well, no, it's the one that I've already backed. That, oh, I see. You know? Because I didn't back the first Kickstarter, and I, I kicked myself because it would have been like 400 and some dollars. Mm -hmm. Oh, now you've but spent. I've spent. I've probably spent about three grand on this game Damn. now, just to get caught up yeah. to what. Um, and this last Kickstarter, I spent like 380 on mm -hmm. it, something like that. But, but anyway, uh, what it is, is that it's a Old West theme. Um, that's how it started. And then you would go, you would go into these, these mines... And then uh, it's all scenario based. It's not really a full on campaign. The people have put together all the scenarios into a campaign. You play it as an overarching RPG session, though. So, like, you keep uh, your stats for your people, level up, all that stuff. Um, but you go into the mines. Um, you, as you go through, you're going to have encounter. Random encounters could pop up, which will bring random monsters or events, different odds and ends. A portal could pop up. If you decide to go through the portal, it throws you into these other worlds that they have a ton of different ones going from a, a derelict spaceship with zombie astronauts. So there's always a picture in my head of a cowboy stepping through, and then all of a sudden right. you see a, you're on a spaceship. You give ye you your know? last hop. Right. <laughs> But that, but there's some worlds like if you go to Targa and stuff, you can get a laser sword, you know, or, or machine guns or grenades. If you go to Tradera, you know, just mm -hmm. there's swamps, there's all kinds of just stuff. The last Kickstarter was was the Forbidden Fortress, which was a starter set, um, which was in feudal Japan. I'm not using it as a starter set because I'm not a big Feudal Feel Japan, Japan guy, person. Yeah. So I'm using it as an other world, which you can do. So I'm still going to start any adventure in the West, but I, a portal could take me to this feudal Japan mm -hmm. world. Um, it almost, if you watch Westworld on HBO and all that My that mom show, says I would really like that yeah, show. Yeah, I think you would. <laughs> um, it's kind of like that because there's like you're, you're just going to all these different type uh, genres, you know, and, and stuff. But all the while... Um, there's versions, they, it's so in-depth that you have a stack of monster cards, but there's variations of these, because if you're in, some of them will pop up in different worlds, mm -hmm. so that when you buy these monster packs, they have the cards that will go into these decks, so if you're in this deal and you get a random uh, encounter, you pull out the deck and pull a random card, and it's, it could be, this is the ice version of this. Mm, dragon yeah, or right. whatever you know and stuff there's just there's unending possibilities with this game um and uh i have did they ever change uh, like the town or like the mutation boards or is it all still the, the same? mutations chart still the same okay which is something else so like if you if you get six corruption at any one time then you mutate mm -hmm. so then you you're gonna roll uh two dice and then you look on the mutation chart and you're going to get a mutation. 
Um, it can be my character right now in the campaign, the longest going campaign I have, I have four mutations. I have, uh, I have horns, so I can't wear head or hats. <laughs> Wait, you have, can't. Oh, I have a tentacle probably... mustache. Neat. A um, second penis. I have no. I have a. I have a. Uh, uh, chi- void child. Like think of like Total Recall. Remember the old Total Recall with Arnold Schwarzenegger? Never seen it. Oh my god. <laughs> okay. Remember. <laughs> and there's Quato. Uh, he was this. There's this alien that was living within. Like. Okay. A, he was a sentient being that was like growing out of this guy. Okay. And it was this little creature. Gotcha. Right? Well, I have one of those. All right. And he and I even bought a little pistol for him. So now <laughs> I, so he has a little pistol. That's funny. And then I have stone skin. Um, but if you what happens with these mutations is what if you can never have two of the same. So if you ever roll that again then you die. Oh, okay. So that's the risk of running cuz cuz mutations can be helpful or yeah. helpful. Okay. You can get them cured at town. Gotcha. At the mutant quarters and stuff, you can go yeah. and do different things, um, which could also kill you if it's a botched surgery. I mean, it's mm-hmm. yeah, this is the the most RPG game. I talked about folklore earlier. Mm-hmm. This one is the most because between adventures, you go to town, you go around shopping, you can play games, you can get in a shootout in the street, you can go rob a bank if you want, you yeah. can go to the doctor and try to cure your ails. You can, I mean, you, there's anything you can. Right. Do anything you want, you know, and, and then you just go out on your next adventure, you know, and, and stuff. So it's, uh, it's a, it's a great one, you know, just, <clears throat> excuse me, but, uh, there's three big core sets out, independent core sets right now. Mm-hmm. Um, these new ones that are coming out are, will, are called Shadows Rooms and Adventures. Okay. Um, they will be. They're expansions, mm-hmm. but they can also be played standalone. Gotcha. Um, and they'll, I think they're uh, Valhalla and then the uh, more swamps. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool because what they've done, they've essentially kind of adopted that smash up <coughs> kind of idea is that because they made it, okay, well, if they were Western, they did, they. They have maybe one right. expansion, but now they're just like, oh well, there's portals, yeah, you can so they can just be like, oh okay, like Valhalla, okay, that's something unique. They could yep. do a bunch of just different time travels and be like, mm-hmm. oh okay, well now you're he's in. I mean, if they want to go real, real, then it's like World War Two or something. Well, there that one of them, that Tradera, mm-hmm. is an alternate reality World War Two. Oh okay, see on another planet. <laughs> yeah. So, so everything when you go on that world and do stuff, mm-hmm. there's bunkers, there's wire. Yeah. There's like wire trenches. There's yeah. grenades, and, and it's, it's all same... snowy. It's like it's like you're in Germany World War Two. You know. It's... Yeah. So that's <clears throat> it's it's really cool. And the, uh, um, I mean, hell, they could even do. Hey, well now you're in the last night on Earth or whatever. They can because it's the same company, yeah. So you can just be in this there, it's this Victorian era fantasy, or it's like this folklore era. The amount of play testing that you'd have to do for this is sure. Nuts. Yeah, I mean, and there's so many chits and so many tricked out things mm-hmm. that you can do. I buy, I bought real poker chips for keeping track of XP. Oh, nice. And it's 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 a rabbit hole. You probably don't want to go down. Yeah, it was one I was about to, and I'm like, nope, I'll just play yours if (laughs) if I ever really want to play Shadows. Yep, yep. Awesome. What's my number one? Scythe. It is. It is Scythe. It was number one in 2018, (laughs) and it was number one in 2017. Um, Here's the thing, is, like, Scythe is just, like, the perfect game for me in, in all aspects. Like, in... Like the the worker placement era, the theme I think is really cool. I like an alternate kind of historical Europa. Um, just the radical different strategies of each different faction um, and how you go about the expansion. Now here's the thing: Scythe base game would not be my number one. Like right. it, it'd probably still be top ten, but not number one. But with all three expansions, the invaders from afar added the the two factions, so the Japanese and then the I can't remember where Nord, oh, Nordic was blue, but the green one uh, that those added just, you know, even more factions to play. The Winds Gambit really shot it up there just because of the, now the, you have more mobility, which was kind of a problem with base game Scythe because until you finally got the resources to make your wa- Riverwalk mech, 
n- you couldn't you couldn't advent right. you know adventure out now depending on the types of tiles that come out for your winds gamut they can carry people or they can carry resources but now they have a passive ability and an aggressive ability and indicate how fast your ships can move so that'll create a different uh, variation then there's also different ways that the game can end instead of just your standard six six stars um this game you want to talk you talked about i can't remember what game you mentioned of what was elegant but that's what scythe is to me seven wonders seven wonders yeah yeah. so scythe i mean one it was a game built around its artwork Mm -hmm. and its artwork is just absolutely beautiful i love i mean i have a stack of of uh encounter cards like about that big now that whenever you go there you draw and you you basically the options of what you can do pertains to the art which i think is just wonderful um but just how you play you know with you with your four options depending on the boards that you got which will give you a different combination of what you can do the player interaction like even though there's hardly any like it's not a combat war game but you can be you can be combative is streamlined and simple you can increase your own power track to okay well now i have this but you can only spend a max of seven um plus your card like you can always play one card but if you have more characters or mechs in there you can play more um and if you win then you just you either if they have resources there because resources stay on the board so you don't want to hoard because that makes you a target um if you win combat you just get a star and the more stars you have you'll get more points at the end of the game but what also also made just solidify this as number one was the rise of fenris mm-hmm. expansion um without spoiling anything that story was really really cool not as many choices as i would have liked but like it, it, it was pretty much a streamlined story but yeah they did a campaign for this game justice and what's really neat is that it wasn't a legacy campaign like you could easily go back and play it again mm-hmm. different factions and and have a different time but afterwards all the things that they added in the rise of fenris expansion were module expansions one of them i guess spoiler but it's not that it's not really i think it's the first thing that they introduce is that so everyone has a special ability right uh well in one of the i think it's one of the first ones you can actually trade abilities and so you added some negotiation where it's like well now you have your ability and my ability and you'll get some coins but but now i'm gonna have yours so you just said the little small thing which it's like oh so now it's the red faction that can do the same action over and over i can do that and also I can win by, if I'm playing the black faction, where win by combat or objective. So that's just one module out of the many, many others that it included. If that wasn't it, then the story was awesome. Um, I'm not going to say anything more because it'll it'll spoil things. But then the solo variant is streamlined, solid, like... I think he's. I think they're done with Scythe. I think Rise of Fenris so. was their last one, <clears throat> um, but then they added the modular board, which I did. I played with that. That was fun. Not necessary, but it, if you had a problem with where people started, always starting in the bottom left or something, you can change the way the board looked and where people started. So, I mean, there's really like it's just it it it's my favorite game. Like I I love everything about it. There's like even with Gloomhaven when I was like, oh, it has these things that. I got nothing on Scythe. Like it, it works for me because it's not your standard worker placement where it's like I go here, block you, wait right. my turn. You, you're pretty much in control of everything that you're wanting to do. So that's my number one, Scythe. Orleans. <laughs> <Like, Yeah. yeah. laughs> my number one is Orleans from Tasty Minster Games. Um, it was my number one last year. Was not on my list the year before. You're welcome. That's when that runner was <clears throat> oh, yeah. still number one. Um, this game introduced me more, more or less to bag building. I mean, it wasn't the first bag building game, I guess. Couriers, I guess, would have been the first bag building, but it's a different yeah. genre. Um, but no, this game is it's simple, but yet it's not. Mm-hmm. Like, like, it's easy to learn, but not easy to necessarily be good. master master yeah that's the word i was looking for um it, just playing the base game with none of the expansion stuff required there mm-hmm. there i could see there being kind of a way that you're always going to go mm-hmm. you know 
but then when you start throwing in all the other events from the expansions, mm-hmm. throwing the the, the uh, market board, yep, uh, from the trade expansion, trade intrigue, yeah, um, and throw all that in, and then I've fancy fancified my my little tokens. Oh with yeah, coin that's capsules right. You got the capsules and, and everything. Uh, you, pretty much, you're just. A bag building game is you're t- you're taking tokens in your bag. It's almost like a, a deck builder mm-hmm. deal. You're pulling out a certain number. You put them on your track to use, and then everybody at simultaneously will assign those out on their boards to, for different actions. And then once you've done as much as you want to do, starting with first player, you're going to take an action, mm-hmm. and then you take those tokens that you used, and they go into, into your bag, and you take that action whether it's sailing across water up on the map or marching from one place to another and you're getting mm-hmm. resources as you pass those or if it's um recruiting you know moving up on the book deal or recruiting um characters yep. you know fishermen or monks or uh, like knights i yep. guess um farmers um so there's a set collection kind of thing with this because uh, at the end you know, certain things are going to be worth more. Mm-hmm. Um, I usually would go for the, the silk. Mm-hmm. You know, that was my my very first time ever playing it. I was hoarding silk like yeah. crazy because I had that one engine. The technology that uh, lets you yeah. make it. Yeah. Because um, everybody has access. Everybody has the same actions to start with. Mm-hmm. But once you start getting technologies and stuff, that gives you place things that only you can do. And you can hand pick them. I think that's a big, yeah, that's a big true. thing because if it was random, mm-hmm. you know, it'd be hit and miss. But you actually get to look through that stack yep. and pick the one that you think. So you can look and see what kind of resources are out and about. Mm-hmm. Because the the resources are finite. So if there's a bunch of, um, if there's a bunch of, let's say, silk out on the map, then there's not going to be much silk in the reserves. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to necessarily want the silk producer. Yeah. You know, I mean, you have to kind of look at the board and see which one's going to play. There's also, um, I can't remember what they call it, but those uh, the little gear things that you get that cover up spaces on your board. Developments. Um, yeah, because it covers up and it makes it easier to do those actions. Or maybe technology um, was the tokens and then developments are the tiles. I think that's right. Technology, yeah. Technology with the gears, yes. Yep. So... But the, but you do them I and you just place those on your board so that it make uh, if you need three tokens to do this it may only make it where you need two mm-hmm. you know and it if you're if you're building an engine with your tokens in your bag yeah um, and then eventually you're gonna start putting stuff out here into the the market area and those are getting them out of your bag but in the base game you were just getting I think you just getting you a coin or something coin or, or fucking or, or a book maybe. Maybe, yeah. And then, I think there were some citizens, a couple yeah, of there citizens, were citizens in there. But with the market now, it's like you're actually getting mm-hmm. different stuff out of there. That it's, um, but that's how you cull your bag down too. If you want to get rid of some of your farmers or mm-hmm. some of your more worthless human beings <laughs> in your civilization, I don't need your farming anymore. The, the intrigue. I have never played with. I don't know if I ever will. I'm oh, I thought gonna, you played it the one time. I'm not going to trash it with you. <laughs> I started to. Oh, okay. I had it set up and everything. You're like, it, fuck it, it. It, just, it just wasn't a... You sit there and you start looking at the the stuff mm-hmm. that come with it, though, and it's just like... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like it's, stuff would like it's, kill it's your screwed, people, destroy right, your development. Right, and it yeah. changes the game too much. Yeah. Um, if that was how the game was played, it wouldn't be this high right or this long um what uh the the big expansion the invasion expansion Mm -hmm. brought in co-op play solo play all that stuff i haven't the the co-op is very difficult Mm -hmm. i don't haven't played it that way that much i've only played Um, the one time and we got our ass kicked the biggest thing with that is just the more tiles like yeah all the event tiles that you get because if you just play the base game I think you have 18 tiles, mm-hmm. and that's how many that's how many rounds are in the game. But that that is six different events three times. Yeah. So you know the plague's gonna happen three times. You mm-hmm. know this kind. So whereas if you throw in those other ones, it can, you're gonna have just a total yeah. assortment of stuff. Um, 
Southern, I mean, there's a bunch of different... There's not one way to win this game either. Right. In the core game, it I might can see they're being looking like they're... Development also, track. Right. Yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> but when the, you get the expansions in there and you actually start really exploring the game, there's, mm-hmm. there's ways yeah. and stuff to win. And it's just one I've always been caught up on. Yeah. I need to play stories at some point. Yeah, I got I got it over there, so I'm I'm right. very intrigued by that because yeah. that kind of came out of nowhere. So awesome, awesome, good deal. So that is our top ten games of all time. That was our top one hundred games of all time as of right now for 2019. My list has already changed because I've played yeah, games true. in between that. That's just going to be the nature of it for how long it takes to do this. But um, thanks for if you're if you're still around for for this segment. Thanks for you know watching watching all of it. Let us know uh, what you think of the games we mentioned um, in the comments below. But uh, other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe, and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you. Hey everyone, thank you for watching, and I really hope that you enjoyed the video. If you would like to see more of my content, go ahead and click that subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever I upload any new content. If you feel like supporting the channel, you can go ahead and click that Patreon link to be taken to my Patreon, and any help is truly appreciated. Other than that, stick around for any any other run-throughs or reviews or cool top tens or whatever I feel like putting on. Other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe, and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you.